Joining us in the studio this morning, Jonathan Gibson, political commentator, and Samara Gill, TikTok creator, whatever that is, and a political <laughs> commentator. Good morning to the two. Good morning. Very Good nice morning. to see both Thank of you. Very you. Much well, let, let's start with. I mean, I watched what was going on yesterday that was unfolding with with just abject horror. Actually, my mouth dropped open at the sights in London of these protesters who were brazenly there chanting anti-Semitic chants. They weren't being picked up. We heard about infant infantile uh, this this expression. Infarder. We saw the uh, we saw the, the police standing back. Uh, the police looked totally lost. They looked out of their depth. It wasn't until they got fired at with fireworks that anything seemed to happen. I then tweeted, where the heck is the Metropolitan Police? And finally, they took action. Jonathan, um, and I, I, I will be careful because your family has been caught up in what's going on in Israel. It's a very difficult situation for you uh, as a family and and for you individually as well just just your thoughts on what you saw yesterday so right now i think is a really really difficult time for the jewish community in the uk and across the world i mean we're seeing record spikes in anti-semitism we're seeing language being used which is incredibly painful and incredibly upsetting and unfortunately language is where a lot of sort of hatred starts with and you know it's really, really horrible to see, you know, the implications that a conflict and that this conflict and this terrible, terrible, really painful conflict is having on me, on my family, you know, on mental health across the community. You know, I've got friends, family, who unfortunately caught up in the, the conflict. You know, my brother's there at the moment and that's been really... In Israel. In Israel at the moment and that's been, you know, quite worrying, quite a source of worry for me. But, you know, my primary school WhatsApp group, unfortunately, seems to have turned into sort of a funeral chat, you know. Six months ago, there was a, a girl from my from my class who was unfortunately killed, um, you know, in, a, in an attack. And then, um, you know, in the last few weeks, there's been... Um, one girl, Leora, who was in my class, whose boyfriend was killed, 20 years old. Another, one of my teachers, whose brother was killed. Another girl from my class, whose uncle was killed. And so for us, it's a really, really painful emotional time. And it's very hard sometimes to see this very politicised rhetoric going on in London and also the blurring sort of, of you know, legitimate sort of protest, which people are entitled to, and, you know, pro-Palestinian protest. And, you know, I think people should have a right to free speech. But then that can also blur into, and we have seen, you know, where this blurs into sort of hatred and calls for violence and, you know, support for Hamas, which in their charter, you know, they want to wipe out Jews, they want to destroy Israel, they want to kill me and my family, you know, and our community. And that is really, really hard to see from people that, you know, seem to have this moral certitude that they're doing the right thing, when in fact, you know, a lot of the time they are sort of very happy to sort of ignore or, you know, and sort of support these sorts of uh, organisations, which I find really concerning. Uh, I'm so sorry, and, and that was so eloquent. Um, thank you. Uh, Samara, just in terms of, of what we're seeing, I'm following on from what Jonathan says. Yes. Um, you you also have Jewish blood in you, I believe. You're you're not a practicing uh, Jew. Yeah, no, I do, and I think a lot of people in London are scared right now, and for good reason. I wanted to bring in this so that I get it right, but basically there were placards yesterday depicting a hum Hamas bulldozer crashing through a security fence, um, anti-Semitic genocidal slogans being chanted, um, a woman holding a placard with an image of the Star of David being thrown into a dustbin that said, let's keep the world clean, um, people chanting has rants, um, Israel being more fragile than a spider's web, and then obviously from the river to the sea chants, uh, and people outright chanting jihad yesterday, and two people were arrested. 29. Oh, 20, 20, okay, it's, it's gone, gone up, up to 29 yeah. now, but that's still completely not enough, considering the amount of vitriol and hatred that was sort of just spurred out into London. So why is nothing happening? Because, for me, it was a war zone yesterday mm -hmm. and the police were totally outnumbered. The police knew they were going to be outnumbered. Now, I suppose in some ways the, the good news is it's fewer numbers. There were 10,000 allegedly, not 100,000, which happened uh, last weekend. I never thought I would see a site like that in London. Now, let me just ask you a question. Had it been the other way round or any other group or if people had said we're going to attack the gay people in this country, the police would have stepped in? Yes, absolutely. I mean, it's crazy how Free Palestine has become a bastion of the left-wing movement. I, that's, again, something I never would have predicted, considering most of these people get upset if you mispronoun them. Um, but now they're sort of chanting terrorist slogans and on that side. So it is really confusing what's going on. And I live near the Israeli embassy, and uh, there are people basically walking up and down my high street, police officers, with machine guns, and 
this isn't the country that I signed up to live in. Absolutely not. Well, any of us. Can I just ask you also, Jonathan, I saw pictures of, uh, well, obviously, of the sitting at, uh, at the station, I think it was Waterloo Station. Mm -hmm. I saw people harassing young people, children going into McDonald's saying, shame on you, mm -hmm. because McDonald's had provided some food for the IDF uh, soldiers. And also, um, we saw veterans, people collecting for the poppy appeal, which for Remembrance Sunday, being being overwhelmed uh, as they were trying to do that. But also, the police fist bumping people who were marching, and then telling people to take union flags down. And they were asked why, and they said because these people outnumber us. Mm -hmm. No, I agree, and I think it is really, really shocking that the fact that the number of people have an effect on police policy you know that at the end of the day is unacceptable just because there's a lot of people doesn't mean that you're right in doing you know what you're doing you know i'm sure there were lots of people there that maybe you know at, at some of these protests that you know aren't necessarily going crazy and whatever but there are significant numbers of people that were you know and the, and the met police were not doing anything and then you know when for example posters you know and this has happened on my campuses and a lot of university campuses which is another sort of worry of you know posters of kidnapped children that I must have taken you know when those are being taken down when those are being ripped when those are being graffitied whatever the police you know don't care because they don't well, want to cause a scene. The police, in some cases, have actually taken them down. Right, yeah, because they don't want, what's the word, rising tensions, yeah. you know? I mean, to, okay. be, to be fair to the police, they did do some things, so we can't say they didn't do anything. I'm just putting the point no, from, of course, from, absolutely. from the police. Absolutely. But also, we saw on the tube people chanting again, Intifada, on the tube. Now, how... And there was a, there was a quote from a, a Jewish lady on the tube, and she messaged Sadiq Khan saying, how do you expect me to feel as a Jewish woman? Do mm. I feel safe in London? Answer, no. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's crazy how Sadiq Khan's come out and Yeah, said, where is Sadiq Khan? <laughs> he's come out with peace plans for sort of the Middle East and saying he wants a ceasefire and everything. He can't even solve knife crime in his own country, let alone the Middle East. I don't understand where any of this is coming from. I mean, Free Palestine is more like Free Palestine from Hamas. Yes. That's what it should be. And you see, that is... <laughs> and, and we've talked about this. Do yeah. you think that young people... And, and they were brazenly attacking the police. Do you think these young people who are chanting these things, do they actually understand what they're chanting? Do they... Or have they been so brainwashed? Or are they caught up in the moment? This is kind of... People are framing it as a Iraq War 2.0 type of thing. It's mm. absolutely not. There was a ceasefire before Hamas came and Correct. brutally murdered 1,400 people. They broke the ceasefire. Yes, they broke the ceasefire. So people who are wanting a ceasefire now, uh, I'm not really sure where that's coming from because it was broken by, Palis by Hamas. So I just, it's very confusing as to what their terminology is. Now, 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 now they would on. say that Israel imposed very harsh sanctions on Gaza, but at the same time, a lot of money went into Gaza. We now <laughs> also know the money was used to build all those billions. tunnels. Billions yes. of pounds that went into to Gaza. Now, just, and I completely understand, and I've been accused of being too pro-Israel, I've been accused of being too pro-Palestine, which must mean I must be pretty much on, on, on the right track. But, but just in terms of Israel's response, Jonathan, I totally understand that Israel needs to protect its democratic country. That's absolutely mm -hmm. paramount. But in terms of what is now going on, a million people, 1.5 million people on the move, Israel now launching its first targeted raid into southern Gaza. Mm -hmm. The optics of this now don't look good mm, around the world. Do you, Are you worried that Israel's going to lose the moral high? Oh, ground? absolutely. Uh, you know, look, I, uh, you know, I spent six months working at Haaretz newspaper when I was on my gap year. You know, I am no fan of Bibi Netanyahu whatsoever. I think he's absolutely terrible for Israel, for democracy, for the Palestinians, for peace. You know, I, I met Palestinians, I worked with, you know, many of them while I was working in this newspaper, my heart bleeds for them, honestly, you know, I met people and I know people that have, you know, been been killed, you know, there, and, you know, I worry, I look at the West Bank and what's happening there, and I, I absolutely worry as well, um, you know, and but I don't think... what is Netanyahu meant to do, then? No, no, but it's a really good point, but, but why, do not... you, why do you think he's failed? Well, I, to be honest, I don't think he really, you know, cares particularly about promoting peace. I don't think, you know, he needs to... We need to absolutely, you know, Hamas needs to go if we want any future of peace because they're not interested in it, you know? But my worry is that through employing too a heavy-handed response, you know, through not being, you know, careful enough, you know, in the way that we're responding, you know, what it could lead to is just further radicalization of people. And I, I worry that, you know, we're going to lose, you know, normalization relations with, um, or Israel is going to lose normalization relations with much of the Arab world. It's going to alienate further countries and it's going to lead to further, further polarization. I don't want further escalation, you know. Yeah, I don't want that to happen. Tomorrow? 
What is he meant to do if he allows a ceasefire? Then Hamas will regroup and re-attack and keep going. Okay, They've let me, let me throw it back to you. What about the civilians caught up in the middle of this with no food, no water, no power, hospitals where they can't operate, women having cesarean sections with no anaesthesia? It's horrific, but who caused all of this? Hamas. Israel should not be the people that we're blaming but in this situation. Want, isn't Netanyahu partially to blame too because he failed to secure a two-state solution that he also well, he was caught off guard? Hamas, Hamas and Palestine. I know they rejected it. I'm just, I'm just asking. Five times, five times Hamas turned down a two-state solution. So it's not that one hasn't been put to them. We must always re also remember that well, the reason those incubators are running out of electricity and fuel, while I Hamas... I know they've got the deal, 500,000. But what about Israel's behaviour in the West Bank? Yeah, the West Bank what? is a disaster. Well, they were reclaiming land, weren't yes. they? Yes. Yes. So they, so they are... Isn't Netanyahu Look, they have a role to play in this, but there was a ceasefire, David, and these terrorists crossed the border and murdered innocent people. I think, I, think it, I think it takes, I, I, to be honest, I disagree. I think it takes multiple actors to create peace. You know, I think it takes a responsible, you know, Israeli government. I think it takes responsible Palestinian leadership. And without both, you know, you can't have any so, options. So let me ask you, is the answer to get rid of Netanyahu? Oh, absolutely. He needs to go, you know, of course. I think he's, he's quite frankly, a disgrace, you know. They were warned about these operations, you know. I think the response allegedly. that he's employing is allegedly, OK, but, you know. But he's negotiating with people who don't want to negotiate. So what is he meant to do? What is an appropriate response? But, but, but so, so there are more calls, uh, international calls now for a ceasefire. OK. You, but would, would you, you, you're saying that he should resist that at all costs? Well, I'm saying he's he kind of left with no other choice. He's up against a terrorist organisation. What about a humanitarian pause, which is a, a, a choice of words? A humanitarian pause. Of, well, of course, I don't want to see anyone die on either side, but I do just think that the evil devil is not Israel in this situation, neither, like the Palestinian protesters. But neither protest is it like 18 year old, you know, like half the population are children, you know, like it's, you can't, you know, most of these people were not around They've when had Hamas the Gaza were elected. Strip since 2005. They could have provided, they could have built their own no, I agree water, with you about Hamas. electricity. I, they, they could have done, but, I could but Jonathan's point. I can never not agree with you more about Hamas. I think they're terrible completely. Mm. You know, they killed my yeah, friends, you know, yes. I think they're awful. Yeah. Well, I think that it's, it's important, you know, though, also not to conflate, you know, just random sort of Palestinian people with Hamas, you know? Sure, there's support, but, you know, we have to be careful in, in how we approach this. And my point is just because, just because, you know, a ceasefire is not a good solution, doesn't necessarily, you know, there can be a problem and not necessarily good solutions, you know, or nice solutions. Can, can so I what just, is a good solution? If it isn't well, a ceasefire, I was about to, I was about to say, so let's wrap That's this up concern. just before the break. Going forward, and, and I think your answers have been incredibly measured, and thank you very much for that. And, and I think we've touched on a number of points. Just in terms of, of the solution, what is the solution? Unfortunately, I don't think there is a good one, you know. I think a ceasefire is a victory for Hamas, you know. I don't think it's a nice Okay, solution. so no ceasefire, but is there... A but I, worry, I also, at the same time, worry about them going in to do this because, you know, we've seen the effect of trying to destroy, you know, terrorist organisations with Hamas with the Taliban. It hasn't necessarily mm. worked, maybe cost a lot of lives on both sides, you know. How many Israeli soldiers do we want to sacrifice? How many, you know, Palestinian innocent lives do we, do we mm. want to sacrifice? You know, it's not it's not necessarily easy either side. And, 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 and what about the talk of moving people to, say, the Sinai Peninsula, that you then... Cr create and carve out a new area for people in Gaza to live and let Israel take that land back or indeed that is that what 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 is the solution is there a solution um, give, well, give the hostages back. Yeah, I mean, this could all stop if uh, they just release the hostages. It's, but it uh, won't stop. It won't happen. Uh, that won't happen. Yeah. A, yeah, they exactly. won't do that's it. what I'm but saying. Even but even if they did, it won't stop. So he's negotiating with the unnegotiable. He can't. That, what else is he left to do, Netanyahu? You have to look at this also from a utilitarian sense, like, you know, yes, we're, you know, this isn't about justice, we can't have justice. I don't we'd... think Hamas is coming at it from a utilitarian no, sense. No, we, ha we have to, I'm saying. Hamas, of course, isn't. Hamas don't care about Palestinian lives. No, they have no regard for them whatsoever. They don't care about anyone you know? but themselves. I know, but I'm, I'm, in terms of measuring foreign policy, you know, and what policy we're going to take, we have to think about how we're going to reduce the number of innocent lives that are killed and how, many, how we're going to reduce the number of dead children. I agreed. Um, let's pause there for the moment. Thank you very much, both of you, for the moment. Let's take a short break. We'll be back in just a few minutes. This is Talk TV.
Welcome back to Talk Hi, Today Mr. with me, uh, David Bull, Dr. Rennie in the house as well. We've got Jonathan and Samara with us as well. Uh, thank you for such a considered discussion, actually, before the break. Let's move on and talk about uh, Sue Ella Braverman, the, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the, the minister, the Home Secretary. She wants to uh, restrict the use of tents. So she says the use of tents by homeless people is a lifestyle choice. She says many of those who sleep in tents from abroad are, uh, are from abroad, sorry, and insisted there is no need given the alternatives and support available to rough sleepers. Now, the UK is going to follow the likes of San Francisco and Los Angeles in the US, where weak policies have led to an explosion of crime, drug taking and squalor if action is not taken. And so they want to crack down, targeting tents that have become a nuisance, such as blocking shop doorways and charities which hand out camping equipment face being fined, Jonathan. I mean... I just don't think it's a lifestyle choice. I have no desire next week to go and, you know, take a tent and pitch up in some random place and, you know, I just don't Not believe that it's a But I think you know, what she's saying is, is that people are coming over here as an economic migrants. They are making that choice and then this is how they're ending yep, up Renee, living. Yeah, you're 100% on just... the money. Um, I got the statistics. 44% of sleepers on London streets are from overseas and 21% and, and, and of and them it's very from noticeable. Central and Eastern Europe. So it and is where did you get that choice. figure from? Uh, I got that from a government website. Oh, um, well done. Good. So, yes. So, stop banging the desk. Um, but So, you, you get ticked for that and across for that. You made your point very, very strongly. I mean, isn't that the point, actually? And I've seen it in London now. I haven't seen so much uh, of this this, this tented city in, in, in all the years that I've lived in London. I'm seeing a great deal of it. And, of course, in many ways, here we go again. Suella Braverman talking tough. I think this will appear, appeal to the grassroots. They'll say, yes, I like this. This is good. We'll see no action. I don't know. I, it might it might well be the case. I think you know she does say a lot and not necessarily do the most. I just can't understand like how you know someone, whether you're from abroad, whether you're from, you're from the UK, you know, if you've got a hostel that you can sleep in, why would you choose to sleep well, I, I wouldn't. in a tank? I don't know. But I think that's the point. Yeah, but I don't, I don't believe that they have those options very strongly no, available. I agree because I think they've they've ended up here without any means to support themselves, yeah. and they don't qualify for other support. I have just been to Los Angeles, and I said to David, I was horrified. Oh, by, by the rough sleepers. By the rough sleepers, the tents, and the drug addicts, zombified mm. every row. every three steps, not mm. just Skid Row everywhere yeah i've yeah. heard that there's there's crime there's everything and you can't even walk down the street without someone badgering it they're dead people just lying on the street in la because of the issues and a lot of them don't live in la they've come there the weather's good and the benefits are good yes. jonathan uh, uh, what i would say is that have we not seen though through you know different policies that have been employed that sort of the just get tough on stuff you know it just i don't think that sort of approach has worked unfortunately you know and i think in you know a lot of areas you see in the u.s you know that they're very very tough on prisons terrible conditions there mm. very tough on crime you know but it just hasn't worked and I think you know where what you see the greatest reductions in crime and homeless sleepers is when you try and employ policies to bring people off the streets get them accommodation get well, them that's not bringing them well, off the streets no. is it by and, and LA has tents. actually gone very soft on crime and soft on drugs so actually this is what's happened this is the result of that well, I don't think the hard on drugs policy has worked no, I, think that's also, I think that's also hasn't. I think that's also you know what's resulted in this as well you know if we look at you know in in Britain actually you know Heroin, for example, addiction. It used to be a matter for a doctor, not a judge, ironically. Well, we have and, 383 and, and I've argued for a long addicts. time, let's decriminalise drugs, let's get people back into care, make sure that they have a pathway off it, because also you would remove the black market overnight. When I saw LA, I started to question my view on that, which, as you know, is the same as yours. The other thing I think, obviously... To but say, drugs are illegal in, in the States as well. Not in LA now. No, no, cannabis is legal. Mm, That's all. I think they've legalised more than They that. haven't. But okay, it's not I would check that. that. Uh, well, right, you check. Uh, giving people tents and sort of telling them that you know it's okay if you're sleeping on the street and it's almost not incentivizing it but making it normal is it's not it's not the way to solve this issue but where, uh, where are they otherwise meant to go like they clearly don't have an alternative otherwise why would they be well on the she street? says that there are services available and that actually if they did qualify they would go into those but Rene's point may well be valid I there. Just... OK, you can disagree, yeah. Jonathan, you can yeah, disagree. Yeah. Uh, we have to pause there, we have to pull it to a halt there. Thank you so much to both of you. That's Thank Jonathan Gibson, much. political commentator, Samara Gill, TikTok creator, whatever that is.